Hello and welcome to your daily Detroit sharing what to know and where to go in Southeast Michigan. I am Jer Stays. I hope you enjoy this conversation and thank you to our members on Patreon at patreon.com slash daily Detroit. I am sitting here at Adelina surrounded by three chefs, three talented individuals. This is the newest addition to downtown Detroit. This is a space that has seen a huge change since the last time. But first, Chef Fabio Viviani, I have to tell you, you've already taken a bunch of my money. Did you know that? I did not. By the way, I don't know if they told you, but this is an ambush. By the time you leave, you're going to be well fed and you're going to have at least a full meal. No, I'm just kidding. No, <laughs> we welcome you. How did I take your money before? Where? So at Siena Tavern and Bar Cacetti. Siena Tavern in downtown Chicago and Bar Cacetti in downtown Columbus. Fantastic. All right, then welcome back. Yeah, yeah. So I know that you have a bunch of experiences, and they are different experiences. Why Detroit? Long story short, right? One of the f- owners of this company and this restaurant, and I have been business partner for a long time, Martin from Cicero Hospitality, dear friend of mine. He's a doctor, but he's also has a, he's a very wise businessman, and he has a lot of hands in real estate, hotels, and, and development. And, you know, we had the opportunity to do something with Bedrock and this gorgeous building and Mr. Gilbert and these two gentlemen right here with me, and I said I couldn't miss it. So having traveled to those couple of concepts, Sienna Tavern is different than Bar Cacetti. You have different ideas with what's going on. What is your thought with Adelina, and how do you see it sitting in that universe of yours? So, you know, there is Italian restaurant, there is Italian restaurant, right? Every concept we do is adapted to the crowd, the geography, the, the socioeconomic factor, and the constant is always great food, great atmosphere, and great service for a a fair price, right? I wouldn't say that we are a high-end restaurant. I wouldn't say that we are uber approachable. I think we're sitting right in the middle. We provide fantastic quality. We provide great knowledge, good culture of Italian food and hospitality. But also, if you want to be here and have a plate of pasta and a glass of wine, you don't have to leave with $200 less in your pocket, right? I think that formula for us creating a great vibe, uh, great atmosphere has been winning formula. And and my prerogative was, I didn't want to be the guy from out of town coming in town. I wanted to be the guy from out of town that team up with incredible local talent to develop a few restaurants worth to dine at. We'll circle back to you in a second, but Gabrielle, what brought you to this? First of all, I I was at uh, Baco Restaurant for many, many years and uh, 2019, I took a break and I started doing private chef. So uh, I was a private chef for a few years and then I got a chance to meet Martin, which is one of the owners. And he approached me last uh, November and he asked me, hey, we partnered up with uh, Chef Fabio Viviani and we want to open this restaurant in Detroit. Uh, what do you think? So I said, let me think about it and let me talk to my good friend and chef, uh, Chef Marco. And we decided to jump on board and uh, bring our talent and our cuisine and, and partner up with Fabio and then do some dishes together and then make this beautiful, cohesive, I'll say true Italian Mediterranean concept food to the trade. And what are you looking for yourself to bring to the table? What are you looking to accomplish? My greatest accomplishment for me is to see people happy when they eat our food. We like simple. I don't like complicated things. I do respect the food a lot, so I like to stay with salt pepper. I'm a kind of chef. That's my accomplishment here. That's to see people happy and bring bring a new spot to Detroit that people can come in and have a true plate of pasta, and then maybe they can have a Spanish octopus, and they can have a beautiful dessert. Chef Marco, really, what brought you into this? Well, that was... Uh Chef Gabriel, uh, really. Uh, yeah. So what I hear, it's all his, it's all his fault from here. So me and Gabriel goes back in the days. I've been uh, a chef at Baco for 14 years until 2021. Then I, I departure Baco and uh, I took a step back. I went uh, to a, a Motor City Seafood Company as a manager. And then Gabriele came along and he goes, well, you want to go back to the kitchen? And me and him worked together for seven years at Baco. We became best friends. And I go, hmm, what's the deal? They said, well, there's this restaurant, Adelina, and uh, uh, we're going to partner with Fabio Viviani. But he said, but we can make our food, and our food sparkle. And it's downtown, and it's, uh, it's, it's prime. I mean, it, this is a prime location. Came and talked to the owners. 
I mean, it was a fast deal yeah. because uh, this was the beginning of January and then here we are. We did the menu and everything and it's been fantastic. And uh, also, you know, I met Fabio yesterday for the first time. And uh, after a couple hours, I felt like I know him for, for 20 years. You know, it just uh, it's just something that it was just in the skin when we start to taste food together. And we have the same understanding, the three of us, of uh, how the food should be. It should be, it's food for the soul. It's not just a plate of pasta. It's something that will give you that emotion when you get up at the end of the night to say, oh my God, this is the best meal I ever had. And uh, it all starts from our background. We are all three from Europe and we all have basically a background with our grandmothers cooking, smell, and, and that's the joy in our heart. And then uh, that's what we're trying to bring, here. To, 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 bring to others. Yeah. What sets a plate of pasta apart as food for the soul to you? And it's open to anybody. The chef that makes it. We're not the only good restaurant around. We're not planning to be. We're planning to be the one that gives you the best memory because it's a combination of food done by people that understand tradition good hospitality out front, great drinks, great ambient. You know, seldom people go out for dinner because they're hungry. If you're hungry, you eat something on your own house. You don't go out, you don't make plans, you don't invite friends, you don't get ready, you just eat. When you do the latter, they just eat, you make yourself something and you satisfy your hunger. When you go to a restaurant, you gotta get an experience. Food is a major component of that, but not the only one. So that's, I think, is a differentiator. What we're trying to do is a cohesive, it's like, a, it's like an orchestra, you know? Everybody's playing their instrument the best they can. And when you have good player, then you have a symphony. One of the things that strikes me about what you said, when I go to cities to dine, there's an ecosystem of restaurants. And it very much seems to me that you all see yourself as part of the selections because I think I've talked to a lot of owners over the years, a lot. And they're like, we're the only place to go. But I don't think that's how diners work. And part of what grows a restaurant community and makes a city notable for food is that you've got options and you're all part of something bigger. Trust me, when you think you're the best is the minute you're already lost. And the reality is that be the best if that even exists. It's a lot of consistency and a lot of overtime. I tell people, please join me on grand opening, but judge me 30 days later. Because there is going to be a mistake. There is going to be things that happen that we have to figure it out. You know, most of us never work together. Yes, I've been in this business for 33 years. This is probably, I've opened 100 restaurants under my own brand. But the reality is that although my team and them and everybody has been working together for months, some of them, they've been cooking together for a week. Mm -hmm. Right, because you don't have a restaurant until you have a restaurant. Mm -hmm. It is a very, very, very dangerous mentality to think that you're doing things better than other. Because what sets apart is not the single meal, is the consistency over 10 year period. So like I tell everybody, I don't want to be the only restaurant people go to because that's ludicrous. I just want to be the best one over time. That's it. I remember when I was going to Chicago, I had three different friends tell me, you need to try Sienna Tavern. But Sienna Tavern, although it's a phenomenal restaurant, is not the only restaurant in Chicago. I, when My own family, when you go to Chicago, I tell them to go in different places because everybody does something better than most. You see what I mean? When you were thinking about the design of the space, what were some of the thoughts that we're kind of bandied about. I know that, you know, you all work in the kitchen a lot, but I mean, you're, you're near it all. How does that relate to the food? Oh, oh, you're asking chef about designs, so. What do you like? <laughs> just <laughs> no, tell me what you like. No, 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 I'm just messing with you. Like, the reality is that, you know, I'm a, I'm a food guy, but I also understand that people require comfortable environment. They require certain space. There is only a few restaurants in the United States that they're not very comfortable, but they're also very busy, right? If you think about, they, they squeezed in like legendary places like Carbone or Rails. Uh, Bathazar. In, yeah. in, you're just pa packed right in you're Bathazar like, in New I York. Mean, you and I are going to have dinner at Bathazar. By the end of the night, we're best friends because <laughs> I'm on sitting neck to neck to you. So if you got to move, I got to move, right? But those are the few and far in between. So a restaurant has to provide a good surface for eating, good environment, good seating, comfortable, but not too comfortable. You know, it's because you don't want to camp out there. You want to spend a couple of hours for dinner and then you want to go somewhere else. So the reality is that there is a science on this playing table and the lights, the ambience and all that. Now, we're not the expert at that, mm -hmm. but my company has a lot of people that know a whole of a lot about that mm -hmm. and I trust their judgment on it. You know, I'm not the chef that picks, I need this plate, I need this glass, I need... 
Because some are. I've talked to some that are very particular. Yeah, but how many restaurants they do have? You see what I mean? Yeah. That's what I'm saying. You should stick with the things you do best. And the three of us, yeah, sure. Can I have an opinion about plate? Absolutely. But it's not relevant for what we get paid to do. People have the tendency to want to do more than they're asked. And when they do that, they usually tend to distract from the purpose. My purpose, and I feel their purpose, is to create the best food possible for the concept and make sure that that food and the people that work with the food also make sense for the business, right? It's easy to create good food if you have unlimited budget, unlimited space, unlimited... But we also run in a business, so that's to have to be a balance of a chef. Front of the house, leave it to the front of the house. In business, what I've learned is sometimes people do more than they're asked, but less than they need. That's what I'm saying. Exactly. This industry is actually very easy. The hard part is not to complicate it. Let's say, I see, you know how many times I see chef arguing about what the front of the house should be doing? Just chill. Worry about the things you should worry about it. Because I got bad news. You're not good at everything. And now, mind you, we are a very open company. So I love feedback. I love for a chef to tell me, hey, dude, I think the front of the house needs these five things. But the moment that you have to do that and it distracts you from what you're supposed to be doing, that's the moment that my process and procedure come in place and say, all right, guys, hold on. I need the feedback, but I don't need you to find a solution. We got this, right? Let's give us time. It would be like a general manager going to the kitchen and telling them that the sauce is not thick enough or thin enough. Sure, it might be right, but there is a process and there is a place to tell certain things, and people forget that. Isn't that part of the strength of opening so many places as you all have? That's what I try to tell everybody. What do you need? Do you need a good working environment? I can build you one. Do you need a forever home? I got you. Do you want to be a restaurant owner? Give me a year or two. Let's work together and then you can open 10 restaurants. I will be behind you doing that. But there is timing and people forget that things take time and everybody wants everything right away. Immediate satisfaction, immediate gratification. The whole social media things, I think, screw a lot of things up. You know, because now everybody's a food critic. Everybody thinks everybody makes so much money and everything is easy because they make it look easy on social media. And that's actually the opposite of what that is. Takes time takes focus, takes dedication, takes a lot of humble pies because I'm not good at everything and I know that. Most people don't got the memo. It's one of the reasons, and it sometimes frustrates our audience when I will say, look, anything that I talk about a restaurant in the first 60 days is a first look. I never label anything as a review or my actual now thoughts. to the grand opening and give me 30 days before you judge. Yeah. That's what I tell everybody. Yeah, we can talk about the decor, we can talk about the theory, we can talk about a couple of highlights. But, you know, when a place really gets their feet wet is when, you know, that you can really start, it starts to yeah, sing. And, and, you know, in every new restaurant we open, we have a new team, new organization. So we implement our best model yet. But every restaurant is different. It's like when you have five kids, you can have, you can have some genetic rules for all five kids. But if you have a three years old, seven years old, a teenager, two boys, one girl, you got to have different, different approach with everybody because... It's different. You know, Siena Tavern, it's, it's a gigantic mm. restaurant. Barchiquet is a tiny one. And the, so I, that led me to my next point is like, you also have to think about, you're thinking about the family. You also have to think about where the house is. If you're in the first floor of a hotel, right. you have a different job to do than and if you're, you're like in the, de- the rooftop yeah. or if you're a destination spot along a strip. Each place has a different job to do. That's why everybody's expertise has to match the expectation of the restaurant. There is no such a thing as... I'm the chef, I do whatever I want. Because sometimes whatever you want to do doesn't serve you well. So do most things that you want to do, whether you're a chef or a GM or a sommelier, but you also got to understand the business. Because if you don't, the business is not going to do well and you got to go somewhere else. So, and a lot of restaurants don't make it. And, and I think maybe that's, that's part why, of why. And that's why a lot of restaurants don't make it. Because people have strong opinion, but they're not humble enough to recognize when they should or shouldn't bring them to the table. Chef Gabrielle, what's one of your favorite dishes that you love to either make or enjoy? Because I want to give people kind of a profile of the two of you, of like, what are you you into? Uh, A lot of even my friends or people that I meet, they ask me the same, what's your favorite thing? My favorite thing is lamb. So 
for me to say lamb because I grew up with lamb. When I moved to the United States, it was kind of hard for me to find something that it's as strong as uh, European lamb is. So I would say lamb uh, will be one of my favorite things to cook. And I love anything that's root vegetable. I love set of root, a good fish, but ma- mainly meat. I'm, I'm more like a meat kind of guy, anything that involves, but lamb is one of my top go-to. Chef Marco. Mostly homemade pasta. Well, I focus on everything uh, uh, through my 40 years in the kitchen, but uh, I always go back to homemade pasta, homemade uh, sauces, ragus. I love hearty ragus, hearty soups, because that's where I grew up in, in the north of Italy, and it reminds me of home. So I always go back to, to that route. Chef Fabio? Well, for me, it's the ability to find ways to make people happy with the expertise that I can provide. You know, not everything I like, people like. Okay, what's something that you like that most people don't like? Offals. Really? Okay. Brains, lungs, liver, kidneys. I love it. I will eat tripe and intestine all day, and most people in this country wouldn't touch if they're starving. Listeners should know both of the other chefs are nodding their head in agreement over here, which is great. That's great. But it doesn't matter because we're all intelligent people, and I love that he likes lamb, but historically lamb doesn't perform well on menu unless... It's a shank and it's braised, you know, lamb T-bone. They're cute, adorable, very fancy, don't sell. You know, lamb chop, they're fantastic. They do sell well, but unless someone with knowledge cooks them, they're always chewy and overcooked. So it's much better if you don't put them on the menu unless you're the one that cooks them every day. You know, it is what it is. We are a, a company of number and statistic. If I tell you that a dish for as great as it might be, probably won't sell. Someone should listen because I've tried it a hundred times. That's why you can't find tripe on my menu. That's why you don't find papa pomodoro in my menu because people don't understand in this country that a bowl of overcooked tomato soup with stale bread is a delicacy in Italy, (laughs) but I can't charge you $20 for it because you throw it chairs on me, you know? And so we don't do it. We keep it for Sunday dinner at home. (laughs) It's funny because I was talking to Marco when we were going through like sure. designing the menu. I said we should put tripa. And, tripe. and then Marco wine. said, no, 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 let's not. I grew up yeah. eating tripe soup, right? We have, we had in Romania. I mean, we, I think we make Mexican soup. Mexican with menudos, they got the whole things figured out. Yeah. But I can't sell it. And even if I do in a Mexican restaurant, it doesn't sell very well. Yeah. What is this? Tripe. Oh, what is that? Cow's intestine. Oh, no. I. Screw that. I'm not doing that. And that'll work in like five neighborhoods in America. That's what I'm saying. But most chefs will be like, absolutely, you're wrong. I make the best tripe in the world, which might be true, but nobody cares. Literally, the minute that you learn and realize that nobody cares about what you're thinking, it's the minute that you become on your way to become a successful business person. You have to do what you're passionate in way that people buy it. That's it. Now, I tell everybody, you want to do your own things? Open your own restaurant. Until that day that you're actually playing with your own livelihood, you have to make sure that you balance what you're good at it with the expectation of everybody around you, including the investor, including the diners, including. And the best case scenario is actually Adelina. 90% of the menu is chef-driven. We do the things we like to do, but we understand that there is a business behind and you can't do everything. In the culinary scene, that's actually the point of the pop-up to me, right? When you see a pop-up where someone's doing for one weekend or two nights, that's actually the point. To me, that's the best use of the pop-up versus the restaurant. You know why? Because of this. Because it's gone in a week. Yeah. So you don't have enough time to know if it was a viable business model or if it was a total flop. I mean more as an artistic yeah, expression. Oh, absolutely. For a chef, the greatest things of all time. I've done thousands of pop-up in my life because I get to do whatever the hell I want for six days because it doesn't matter. Yeah. Usually you charge more than you would in a restaurant. It's a short amount of time. And anyone, anyone can pack a restaurant for a week. Mm. Can you pack it for 10 years? That's the challenge. What's key to packing a restaurant long-term to you? A very good balance of great food, great hospitality, great ambience, great entertainment for a price point that people are willing to pay over and over and over. 
NFL draft is coming. Are you excited about all the people that are going to be coming through here? I am, absolutely. You know, Detroit will play a huge role in the NFL this year. And uh, we are very familiar with the NFL business. I just recently hosted the entire NFL management team, Mr. Goodell, Commissioner, and everybody else in Kohler, Wisconsin, for the 2025 draft. My company was called to host the whole event. So we're very excited to have him in Detroit. All right. Well, Chef Gabriel, Chef Marco, Chef Fabio, thank you so much for uh, having me over. And, uh, you know, we just made this work as the podcast table today. Appreciate it. I like the mobile podcast. You guys got a nice setup right here. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to tell a friend about the podcast. Word of mouth is the best way to grow the show. With that, I am Jer Stays. Remember that you are somebody, and we'll see you around Detroit. Talk tomorrow.